Question number two, how would you define the so-called cabal? Who are these people and where are they mostly represented? I.e. what organizational bodies, corporations, etc. I would say that you're talking about um, a, a certain portion of the corporate billionaire class of the world who are mostly involved in uh, petrochemicals, uh, coal, like old, really, really dirty uh, energy sources, which the people who are involved can skim tons of money off the top. So they make billions and billions of dollars a year skimming off the top of these really unclean energies. And the last thing that those people want is disclosure event, free energy technology. So they have always been the main wall against uh, disclosure information because they seek to lose the most. So pretty much if you're looking at the worst petrochemical coal environmentally polluting billionaire industrialists, those are pretty much the enemy and, and whoever they are and whoever that they're really supporting and putting their cash behind are, you know, who they're supporting to be the enemy as well. Not saying that that makes everybody who's not them saints it doesn't we have a lot of imperfect billionaires and politicians who are not saints and not perfect people who are at least trying not to be horrible fascist nazis so you know it's if you got a choice between eh and nazis i think eh is better than nazis that's my opinion but um it's okay. it's very complicated and and unfortunately fortunately or unfortunately there's mounds of incompetence on all sides so to be honest if the uh, competence level of the neo-fascists and the Nazis was better, it would be over by now. They would have won the conflict and taken over and it would be over. And if the people opposing that, the, we'll call them the sort of allies, the, the traditional sort of Western and whoever else comes into the allies like in World War II, um, they're not necessarily super competent either right now. So we've got this mix of competency and incompetency and I'm just crossing my fingers hoping that it all doesn't go to shit. But it probably will before the alien invasion, but let's, uh, we'll get to that later. So anyway. All right, cool. Okay, got it. Interesting. Uh, number three, there is intel that Ukraine has been a major center for the off-world human trafficking with multiple underground holding facilities, presumably containing hundreds of thousands of people in different locations. Is this true? And what groups are involved in the human slave trade in general? Um, no, that is pure propaganda. That is straight out of Kremlin uh, office propaganda for sure. Um, now, here's here's I want to point this. Here. Let's let me go another step and say this. Uh, any anybody who's ever heard of the QAnon phenomenon, that is a Russian-based psychological operation. I've been trying to tell people this for fucking seven years, and okay. some people have listened to me and some people haven't. But I have repeated this again and again and again when it has been brought up. It is a Russian Kremlin psychological operation. Oh really designed to divide and conquer people in America, and it spread. It spread throughout the rest of Western world and then started to spread in other countries, but it was a psychological operation designed to divide and conquer uh, Americans, um, and it just spread, but it is absolute garbage. Now, there is a truth of human trafficking, but it's not what conspiracy people think that it is. Conspiracy people want to say that's all these things with no proof, no evidence. I've asked people many, many times, show me what you got. You got video evidence? Do you have audio evidence? Do you have any documented communication evidence? Do you have any eyewitness reports that you can show me that as an investigator I can follow up on? They can never produce one piece of evidence. Now, on the other hand, I have studied some of what is actually happening in human trafficking and actual human trafficking and looking at actual police reports and FBI reports and DHS reports. And so there is a thing happening and it's horrible, but it's not what people are thinking that it is because what people think it is, is a distraction from what's actually happening. So it is the okay. biggest distraction to get people to care about human trafficking, which is great, but to care about it in a way that is completely misguided and misappropriated and completely missing all of the actual trafficking that has happened right and over if, their nose. And, right if we their and if we mention the, uh, the the space human trafficking to 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 other places and stuff, who's running that if you if you know? Oh, that's a that's a whole other thing. That is a whole other thing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's off is, world, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and, and the numbers are not even what people would suggest or think that they are. It, it's, it's mostly an off-world thing, and it's mostly happening in other places and with the colonies and so forth. Uh, a lot of that activity has moved off 
of planetary surface as most of those people have moved off planet to sort of be at a distance from whatever's happening down here with the stinky surface dwellers. So, you know, we used to hear the number 1 million people being abducted for different reasons, not just slave trade uh, a, a year. Uh, that's not accurate anymore. Nah, not even, not even. Okay. No, since, I, I would since, say- Since when, since what time? Um, I would say that what we would define as conventional criminal uh, human trafficking accounts for, you know, like easily, you know, 15 to 25 million uh, persons annually, you know, uh -huh. around the world, which is a pretty good sized number. Um, but when you're talking about covert, you know, military intelligence, space program trafficking, that's become a whole other thing. A lot of it because of internal issues that have had to be settled because we've signed treaties with other species that actually guarantee that we won't engage in certain acts of slavery or slave trade or enslaving personnel, persons without, you know, giving them rights and so forth, especially if they're Terran citizens, Terran born citizens, et cetera. So we've had to clean up uh, our own slave problems uh, in order to be treaty compliant. Mm -hmm. So th those numbers have come way down and the people who are really involved in those things have moved those activities outside of the legal sphere in which we can maintain that uh, or do much of anything about it. So there are people who try to stop those things and hunt those people down, but just keeping in mind the people who are really motivated to do it, spend the time, money, and energy on it are going to keep slipping around as long as they can. So, but because we're treaty bound, we've had to reduce tons of that uh, within Terran space. I see. But that, that might still be happening somewhere outside the, I don't know. Oh, the, I'd, the, I'd the, say. The, the belt or something somewhere. Um, there, what I can say about uh, the colonies off world are that they are probably far less regulated um, yeah. than some of the things that are actually happening in Terran space right now. So, and we keep reaching out and stretching out and, you know, taking new people and breeding more people and engineering more people to make colonies in different places. So once you get farther and farther away, the regulatory ability to ensure that the laws are being obeyed by those people gets harder and harder. And naturally the people that want to do those things know that and they're pushing themselves farther and farther okay, to it. the reach of that activity to continue to get away with what they can get away with. So okay, I, have to, I have to admit the problem's not solved, uh, but we've made it sort of cleared most of the internal cancer. So it's a more of an mm -hmm. external cancer. Got and it. I, Got it. All right. I say give it time, give okay, it time. Cool. Cool. Uh, things are changing, give it time. Okay. Uh, there was intel that in the late 40s, early 50s, there was a joint U.S.-U.S.S.R. operation in Antarctica that involved the deployment of nuclear nuclear weapons against the German bases. Do you have any data correct. on this? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And it, it's, it's correct. Okay. So, and the intel says that after the U.S. and U.S.S.R. supposedly lost to the Germans, the U.S. the U.S.S.R. alone delivered 20,000 Soviet soldiers to the Germans in space to be used on the moon and Mars as labor and troops to fight the local race war. Is that true? Um, I don't know about that specific number, that okay. specific exchange, but what I can say is there was an agreement that brought the Schwabenlanders into a grouping in which a lot of people from around the world were being pulled into, and there were all some sharing of those personnel for experiments and augmentations and you know, psionic experiments, genetic experiments to make better soldiers and so forth. So uh, there definitely was a lot of different countries that were throwing people into a pool and that was being spread around. But to that, a was lot not, of the different that was not a tribute to, to someone for, for, a, for, a, for a military loss. It may have, it, it may have. I, I don't, not privy to that specific exchange. So uh -huh. it may have. Okay, got it. Okay. So what intel do you have about the Russian portion of the SSP? Are they a separate SSP? What's their main specialty and function? And what's the Russian space military's combat skills and personal qualities? Um, my understanding is that 
most of the departments now in different countries, I've been absorbed and amalgamized into the larger space program. So whatever, I, I would say comparably, the Russians secret space program is not unlike the Air for the United States Air Force's covert space program, which is not that good. But everything and everyone is get funneled up. So personnel, material, resources, always get funneled up. Okay, and it doesn't and so, always come back the other way. I, I get it. So, so this is now a joint. <clears throat> this is now a joint endeavor. And what what is the name? Do you have a name for that? Is, is it like a joint SSP international? Uh, yes, it's the Earth Defense Force, the it's EDF. The Earth Defense Force, yes. And what about the the JDFC? I, I don't know. Say what does the JDFC? Joint, I think it's Joint Defense Forces Command. Have you heard of oh, it? Oh, uh, you know, there are so many acronyms. Uh, right. That sounds like an acronym of a department that probably exists. Right. <laughs> okay, there's, J, there's, there's JDFC, there's JSOC that I heard about. It's called Joint, right. uh, Joint uh, Special Operations Command. Special oh, Operations yeah, yeah, yeah. Command. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, is that is that what's uh, I mean? I mean, I, I've I've heard of I've heard of some of those organization organizations specifically. I also know there's like twenty more that also have acronyms that right. I don't know off the top of my head. So that sounds good. That sounds like a, like an or like a bureaucratic organization. Okay, so the Russian the Russian yeah. SSP then is uh, is now a part of the joint endeavor. They don't have any special you know function that has you know specialty or something that they do? Um, not that I'm aware of. My, my understanding is that there's some tiers of separation, but as much of the maximum personnel material technology is funneled upward into a very, very tight cluster of personnel that don't always want to let that information technology drip back down the other way. So, and in the context of what you said about Ukraine and uh, the invasion there, uh, whatever is happening on the ground, how is that affecting the joint space operations? For example, you have a, you have a country, whatever th this country may be, you know, China, Russia, South, North Korea, something like that. You have a, then you have a joint space operation and then there is this uh, ground conflict going on. So how does that, you know, trickle to? Well, at programs? the moment, it's, it's still a hands-off policy until it, it doesn't, until it needs to not be a hands-off policy. So uh, the policy for, you know, EDF forces has been to not interfere with localized ground military action unless there's a justification in which they would need to become involved because of some domino effect of something that could happen. So what could affect that, uh, for instance, could be uh, if Putin makes the decision, which we're almost certain he's already made the decision, it's just a matter of when to use some form of weapons of mass destruction or atomic warheads. So that could incur, you know, someone to say, all right, we have to do something about that. Or they may decide, all right, let's see this play out for a minute because they're more focused on trying to protect from an outside threat. And there may be some some need to let that play itself out a little bit for a second, but I, I'm not sure. I hear a lot of things that are happening right now that have been shifted and changed because this changed things. Uh, this, this wasn't exactly supposed to go this way. And the next event and the next event was supposed to be fairly predictable. And now we've thrown that off a bit and now we're in a little bit of gray territory. Good, thank you. Uh, are the Space Germans currently in alliance as war or neutral with the group that you represent? I would say that uh, definitely not, we wouldn't definitely call them neutral or in alliance. I would say that we're, we're in cold war or hot war in some cases with them right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They're making their move. Everyone knows they're making their move. Everyone knows we're doing everything to stop them from making their move. So yeah, we're not friends. Okay, next question along the same line. Has, has MDF uh, or any other SSP branch ever been under German command? Um, so yes and no. The Schwaben Launders have certainly had a part in the fleet and have also done their best to maintain their own fleet mm -hmm. and as much of a separate fleet as possible while having their hands in anything that they possibly can. So they have their own colony. 
uh, on Mars for sure. And they have their hands deep into the cookie jar of the MDF in some ways or had. There's a lot of changes there that I'm not aware of right now because there's so much in flux after the uh, worker revolt that happened, I don't know, what was that, like eight years ago or something like now, seven or eight years ago uh, when they had the worker revolt uh, and the colonies and that destabilized and upended everything. And I, we're, that's still a, a changing situation. So how is, it, how is it possible that they were, they were somehow in, in uh, control of MDF, if MDF is a separate, you know, earth it, I, it, I won't say in control of, I will say having their hands deeply involved because we've had to share certain technology and spaces and information with them because there's been a treaty for decades where they're all part of the covert, the global Terran Earth uh, covert military space program. I see. So we've, we've known for decades since the end of World War II mm -hmm. that they were just biding their time until they could try again because, you know, Nazis got to do like Nazis got to do and try and take over the world because that's just what they do. They suck, but they got to keep trying until we squash them. And I'm all for squashing them. Thank you very much. But uh, we knew it was coming, but we've had to play this kind of cold war cooperation thing but no, I, I'd, I'd say it's getting pretty ugly in some cases, but I, I don't know that every, anybody's just actively trying to shoot anybody out of the sky yet, but give it a minute, that, that's coming. Okay. How many worlds does Terra have bases slash rep representatives on today, to your knowledge? Um, I would say we have bases and embassies on no less than, gosh, probably over, over 50 or 60 worlds right now. All bases right. and or embassies. Yeah, that's, and that's growing. That number grows every year. Yeah. Every year, that number grows. Are there any assets from the Baltic countries in the SSP? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and what is their, what are their capacities? Um, again, there's always been an, uh, a, a goal to filter up. So mm -hmm. uh, superior personnel from all ranks, all services, all military branches are always being looked at and asked to come join and do other things. And so uh, I'm certain that there are, I, I have no idea what numbers, uh, but you know, pilots, engineers, you know, soldiers, probably all the things that everyone else does. They pick the best of the best. I'm sure they got a few in there. Right. So uh, the next question you told me that it's classified. And the question was how many Terran assets are serving in the SSP right now? What percentage does it in real time and the parallel timeline? now? Uh, in your estimation, and I know it's classified, in your estimation, uh, okay, so you, you know that, but you can't say. <laughs> I see, okay. I mean, in your estimation, is it a, a tenth of uh, thousands, tens of thousands, or more? Oh, more. More than that, okay. More. Over a hundred thousand? Yes. Okay, interesting. Uh, when was the time travel first used in the SSP? According to William Tompkins, he said that the, the, the 20 and back system started working in 1980. That's kind of late, I think. That's what he said. And, uh, you know, judging from, for example, Penny Bradley's testimony, she was sent to Mars as early as 1959 and, 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 yeah. and, and brought back. So that's, yeah. you know, we have like 50, the 50s now. So when do you think was the when do you think the system of twenty and back and whatever time travel uh, was established? I I know that we were working on it. We had engineers working on it on a theory level for sure in the fifties. Uh -huh. They were doing practical work and testing for sure in the early and mid sixties. So I would say by the early seventies they would have had something functional operational. Uh, that they could use, even in a limited capacity with a limber, limited number of personnel that they could, you know, travel forward or back per year or per month or whatever in the early stages. But that would eventually, like everything else, become standardized, industrialized, yeah, so that they'd have as many units, as many machines, as many engines, as many jump gates or whatever that they needed to move, as many personnel as they needed. So that's so not I, counting. I would say, that's not counting the the ETs doing that, right? Right. right. Yeah. No, I, I would say based just on the trackable beginning of you know drawing table, you know uh, testing stage, 50s, 60s, we we would have had 
functional, applicable technology that we could have been applying in the early 70s. And it's interesting that you have parallel time trial programs like Andrew Bushago's, who is saying that the US had the time trial by 1970, which is quite late as well, right? Right. So, so there was like parallel research going on at the same time. Oh, oh yeah, always. There was never just one department working mm -hmm. on something. You know, you got multiple departments, and whoever gets there first gets there first. Right. And maybe though that's not even the most the program that someone is most going to know of because that's going to get shuffled over here real quick, do something super secret, super first, try to get an edge on someone before they can develop it, before it becomes standardized. That's that's always a thing that someone's trying to do with, with military tech. Okay. Uh, how is it that the competing SSP groups seem to all have access to the same pool of human assets? That's an interesting one. Uh, again, there's a treaty. Yeah, there, there's a treaty that everyone basically agreed to and that everyone signed that uh, of all the personnel across the world that would be selected and pooled up, that they would go into a pool that's managed by an independent bureaucratic organization which dispenses those personnel based on requests, uh, need and priority and all that stuff. So there, there's an independent agency uh, that takes, that decides to dispense based on requests. Yeah, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is the, the groups that are maybe not uh, meshing well with each other. Like for example, you have a person who goes to the Navy on, on earth, right? And right. then gets sent for example, up to the moon to serve in Kruger, a German right. mercenary group. And after right. that, gets sent right. to Mars to serve in the MDF. And after that, gets sent to the German fleet to serve there. Yeah. So it's like that sometimes. People get sent yeah. all over the place sometimes. Yeah. I, and I've been bounced around. I mean, who's, who's deciding that? I mean, how can that be? If, if, if you're saying, for example, that your group, uh, the Navy, you know, is it, is it the Navy right. or the Marine Corps? Uh, uh, they're, that both are so closely associated. Right, with right, right. So if, Corps, if you're yeah. saying that you are not, you know, friends with the Germans, and then someone gets sent from the Navy directly to the Germans, or some rogue German group as Kruger or someone else, right. how is it, um, how is that uh, working? <laughs> well, I would say that in the past, it worked very roughly, and that it didn't really work so well, it just worked very roughly. And I would say, as we've moved along in time, there, there have been some stops of certain personnel getting to other departments. And the flow of that has changed a little bit, for sure, uh, as time has changed. And I, I'd say that that whole department's about to get upended for a bunch of reasons. So, for example, but, if someone's serving on, on in, in, in one branch, like the MDF, who can right. come and say, OK, I need this, 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 and this person in my fleet somewhere over you know, in, in, on Pluto or something? Right. Well, there's different. there's a yeah, there, there's a, a process of requests. Uh, when I was in the MDF, there was actually a number of times when we did um, missions that were off world, actually, and we would get requests that would come into uh, our department or through our command structure. And our CO would come to and say, look, I, I need this many. I need six, 12, 18, 24, whatever you know, number he felt was based on the request he was asking for. I need, you know, 22, 24 people who want to go on a seven day, you know, off world mission. I don't know where it's at. You don't know where it's at, but when you get there, you'll know where it's at. You'll get told what to do. And then when you're done, you'll come back here. And it would get sent off different places in the solar system sometimes or space stations, not usually too far, um, but we get sent off for a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, do a sidebar and then come back. And it was really based on requests and availability. So because, wow. and there, there's some massive bureaucracy that has all of those people knowing exactly where they are, knowing exactly what their qualifications are in this massive computer that's smart, it thinks, it's not AI, but it thinks it's an organic computer. It's not the same thing. Um, and it can sort all of that information so that requests can come in and it can literally within a few seconds spit out here are the most likely personnel that we can expend to do that without suffering any negative consequences anywhere right. else. So it's a massive bureaucratic thinking organic computer that sorts that out. Okay, got it. 
Can you comment on the alleged historical division, division between the US Navy and the US Air Force SSPs and their respective ETQ ratings? Is there a hot conflict between these two branches? Yeah, there sure can be. Um, so the Air Force really got a lot of their stuff uh, early as uh, before they became, when there was still the Army Air Corps, before they actually became the Air Force. So some of the earliest air incidences that were occurring uh, occurred uh, over air bases or in the desert, you know, in America, and were handled by the Army Air Corps, which then became the Air Force. Well, the Navy was, you know, if something fell into the ocean, guess who picked it up? The Navy picked it up. So the, the parallel programs were anything that landed on the ground, uh, the Air Force would come and scoop it up. And anything else that landed out in the water somewhere, the Navy would go and pick it up. And, you know, that was sort of their parallel programs of like picking up garbage and scraps and pulling them in for uh, reverse engineering. So that, that started some different thinking. And because the Army, to be honest, is very different thinking than the way that the Navy thinks, because the Navy has uh, what we call a shipmate attitude, which is you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean or a submarine. Everyone matters. Everyone counts because everyone either fights for, mm -hmm. for their lives or everyone dies together. So if there's a fire, everyone fights the fire. Even the captain fights the fire and the doctor fights. Everyone fights the fire or everyone dies. So there's no, even though there's tiers of hierarchy, uh, it's just not the same as when you're in the army. When you're in the army, you're either you matter and you have rank or you're fodder. And that's just it. That's just the difference. You're just fodder if you're nothing. And then if you claw your way up enough, then you have some matter to you. But on a ship, it's not the same. Everyone has to matter or everyone dies in an emergency. OK, so and, and, and you guys actually have sometimes have skirmishes and conflicts. The, oh, if, if there's. OK, so I mean, there are Navy and Marine Corps Special Forces teams who operate on the land, obviously. And so yeah. if something crashes and they're close enough, they're going to try to get it first. And if the Air Force is close enough, they're going to try to get it first. And I was actually at an incident when I was in training where a vehicle came down, hit the ground and we secured the location. Some other guys came to secure the location and said, well, we have orders to take this and we're like yeah well we have orders to take it and they're like yeah okay and they you know backed off some number of yards and our team leader was like okay we need to hunker down and take cover they're going to start shooting at us in a second and we we were we were better shots i guess and so you know they ended up retreating you know because enough of them got wounded uh and or maybe we had better cover but um yeah it was absolutely a hot bullet fight for that piece of technology between navy guys and air right. force guys Got it. So what about the ETs you guys are working for? The, the U.S. Air Force, what, who are they working for primarily as opposed to the, na the Navy? Ooh, that's a hard one to answer because there are multiple species involved in engineering, technology, uh -huh. genetic augmenting programs across all military branches. And right now we're in the dozens of species. So okay. I don't know that I would be able to answer who is mainly sort of right. assisting or overseeing Air yeah. Force operations in the ET world. Yeah, I think we will uh, we'll get to that later because there are questions about this too. If yes. you it did now now the old if you talk about olden days, fifties, mm sixties, -hmm. it would have been the Zetas, it would have been the Grays, but we sorted that out. You know, you mean the you mean later. the Air Force with yeah, the Air Force, absolutely. okay, yep. and the absolutely. Navy. Um, the Navy, we it it changed very quickly for the Navy, and they were dealing with another group uh, that was called the Cortium. A uh, completely different uh, group of spe uh, species that looks very similar to humans, uh, talks more like we do, eats food more like we do. But is that like yeah. the the, the so-called Earth Council? No, the, no? these were uh, ET species that are humanoid. I see. There's a lot of them actually. There's a lot of humanoid e, uh, ET species out there, but there's a lot more of everything else. But there's a lot of humanoids. And and the so-called Earth Council. Do you know anything about them? Um, I mean, there is a loosely agreed upon uh, sort of like similar to a United Nations organization that is uh, a Garthen uh, diplomats and Terran surface diplomats 
and a few ET diplomats that have interests because they have uh, colonies inside the solar system or mm. on the planet. There's a few very t uh, isolated colonies of extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial species that came here a long time ago and are occupying a very tight cornered space where they just want to hide and not get hunted down by the people that annihilated their entire planet, their entire species, other than the ones that are hiding. Uh are, are uh, they working okay are they are they working on cleaning the the solar system from things like slavery you know inhumane acts and so on oh yeah we have to because of the treaties and i would say that we've made tremendous progress at that in the last decade and we're just going to keep making progress at that once we finish this war with the schwab and lounders and we kick their asses once for once and for all i think that will really settle it so oh. I'm ready. For, I'm ready for it to just get on because let's just kick their asses already. They're assholes. Nobody likes them. So let's just kick their asses. I'll be done with it. Send them packing. OK, you said that there was a change in the SSP management in the past 20 years or so. Can you elaborate on who replaced whom and how the policies changed? Oh, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, for many years, the the Air Force certainly had a stranglehold on the intelligence community community's access to information, mm -hmm. and that changed. Uh, that became much more of a Navy Marine Corps special section operation because we just started sending more people to brief people. We just started sending intel officers to brief politicians, to brief diplomats, to brief uh, military, mm -hmm. other lower military personnel, you know, the, and the lower security echelons. We just went around and started briefing people and just started going around the Air Force and saying, we don't need your permission to go talk to someone and brief them on something we think they have a need to know. We don't need your permission to do that. So uh, the Zoom is going to stop because we, we hit the 40 minute mark and let's re-enter. Okay. I'll send you another link here. Okay. Okay. No worries.